Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome to the live Facebook, a show that discusses theological arguments from the book Haq al Yaqeen. I'm your host, Mohsin Shah, and joining me is Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panju. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah, Habibi Mohsin. Sheikhna, uh, yesterday a lot of us were you know, commemorating and celebrating Eid al Mubahala, and now since the evening has come, a lot of us have mentally started to, to prepare for Muharram, the, you know, the holy month of Shahur Muharram and um, the events that are going to take place, some for 10, 20, even up to 50 days worth of commemorations and, and, and you know, events of mourning and grieving. How do we and how does our community mentally, physically and spiritually prepare for the events of Muharram? Ahsantum. This is a very important question and uh, in my humble opinion the build up towards Shahrum Muharram how a person prepares himself uh, during these days leading up to Shahrum Muharram and Safa will actually determine how much he will benefit from Shahrum Muharram and Safa so the preparation that we do pre-Muharram to a great extent determines the amount that we will benefit from Shahrum Muharram. Hi, Awal. Having said this, <coughs> just uh, يعني, a quick uh, pointer. And perhaps this is something that is beneficial not only for us but for all the Mushahideen, our respected viewers uh, in the West. At the moment, one of the things that is of great concern is uh, the issue of the moon sighting. Uh, in that, whether the moon will be able to be sighted by the naked eye, for example, on that uh, Monday night, coming Monday or Tuesday night, for example. So if the moon is sighted in a certain part of the world on Monday and in other parts of the world on Tuesday, on the basis that the Marja Taklid believes in the differences in the horizons, multiplicity of horizons, and there are other Fuqaha and other Mujtahid who believe in the Mujtahideen who believe in the unity of the horizon. And this is a bahath that is usually discussed in Shahr Ramadan because of Eid. Indeed. But for uh, Maraja who believe in the multiplicity of the horizon, uh, it could be very possible that Monday night, for example, is uh, the first of Shahr Muharram and other places in the world, the moon was not sighted. So, for example, Tuesday night is the first night of Shahr Muharram, which means that you could potentially lead to two different days of Ashura. Which so, has happened in the past. Which We've has happened here. in the past, Asantum. So as people who manage Husseinias, who manage centers, what is to be done in this situation? Now we have ittifaq and we have يعني, a unanimous statement granted by the Marajat Taklid that in the issue of Shahrum Muharram, Ya Habibi, Karbala is the Qibla. For when Shahrul Muharram, the beginning of Shahrul Muharram and the commemoration of Yomul Ashura does not go based on the rules of the sighting of the moon for your locality if you are the Mukallid of a Marjat Taklid that believes in the multiplicity of horizons. In this situation, the decision that is taken inside of Iraq is the decision that regardless of where you are on the earth, regardless of whether the moon was sighted or not, you will follow the dates as per the announcement of the Marja'iyah inside of Iraq for Ashura and the beginning of Muharram. That way, the Shias across the universe, across the earth, commemorate Ashura on that one single day. And uh, as you know, the sighting of the Hilal of Shahrum Muharram uh, is marked with this great ceremony. Yes. The Taghir Raya, the changing yes, of, of the, the flags. flags. Yes, in and uh, this in itself is a very important ceremony. I think it is uh, emotionally 
electric, spiritually electric environment. And inshallah, with the barakat of Imam Al Hussein TV, three uh, viewers and mu'mineen, mu'minat who who do not have the opportunity to be in Karbala in person, inshallah, Imam Hussein TV three will be a window to allow people to visit Karbala, inshallah. inshallah and they will be able to witness the marasim on the television, inshallah. So this is just uh, yani bain al kausain mulahada, uh, number one. Number two, in regards to your question, how to prepare yourself for Shahr muharram Habibi, in these days leading forward, there is one hadith that I believe, and every hadith requires contemplation that emanates from Ahlul Bayt, but this one hadith that requires special attention from us, particularly in these days. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And you have the hadith of Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Inna liqat lil Hussein. Hararatan fi kulubil mu'mineen la tabrudu abada. Indeed, within the hearts of the mu'mineen, there is a burning heat, anguish, that can never be subdued. Within the hearts of the mu'mineen, in regards to the killing of Imam al Hussein, there is a harara, burning heat within the hearts of the mu'mineen. This grief, this anguish, it's like a leaping flame that cannot be contained Definitely. inside. This is extremely important because Rasulullah says, Inna li katlil Hussein hararatan fi kulubil mu'mineen. Or Inna li katlil Hussein fi kulubil mu'mineen hararatan. Fi kulubil mu'mineen within the hearts of the mu'mineen. Why is there this qaid restrictions? Kulubil mu'mineen. Ya akhi. From here we understand that one of the alamat of a mu'min is the harara, this anguish inside his heart. If a person was to contemplate over this, he would not have the jur'ah, he would not have the audacity to come and make false statements that, oh, you Shia, you concentrate too much on emotion. Ayyam al-Muharram, the revolution of Imam al Hussein, concentrate on the intellect and leave out the emotion. Rasulullah in this hadith. And we can ask if anyone has the dalil to show us that this hadith has no sort of authenticity. Well, come forward and prove. Now we're ready for a nikash. Rasulullah says that this emotion is connected to the alamat of a mu'min. If we understand these words of Rasulullah, then we don't oppose. And yes, we say, taking the lessons from Imam al Hussein is important, and applying the lessons of Imam al Hussein is important, but as important as that, not less, not more, as important than that is the emotion that is required because this emotion has a door, has got a role in sharpening a person's compliance and understanding that sacrifice and that revolution of Imam al Hussein. And you find that within these days, different people in different capacities are working to prepare for Shahrum Muharram. You find the khutaba, research, memorization, yes. preparation of lectures, one type of service and preparation towards Imam al Hussein. And then you have the Ashab al-Mawakib, for example, the people of the Husseiniyat, setting up the black cloths, ensuring collecting of funds, yes. ya akhi, donations for Shahrum Muharram in regards to the costs that are incurred to ensure that the dhikr of Imam al Hussein remains alive. This donations that are required for these majalis to hold, for example, there are donations for the TV channel, for example, to make sure that the message of Imam al Hussein is broadcast throughout the earth. Each person plays a role towards the contribution of Imam al Hussein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have the people who are attending the majalis. For me, I need to keep in my mind that 
These are the greatest days in regards to the deen. Ascent. Not only the calendar, deen. Our future, our destiny depends on how we behave in these days of Shahram Muharram and Safa. Destiny, huh? Person can be counted from amongst the Ashab of Imam al Hussein if he deals with the days of Muharram and Ashura in the right way. A person can end up being from the Jaysh of Abu Sufyan, from the Jaysh of Bani Umayyah, depending on his based on his stance on Ashura. This is an ongoing imtihan. The based on the way you deal with Yom Muharram, Ayam Muharram, you can either gain Jannah. Based on the way you deal with Imam Al Hussein and the martyrdom of Imam Al Hussein, Wal Ayadu Billah, person can enter into Jahannam wa Bi'sal Masir. These days define our eternity. A person who is looking for inspiration. To change his life, to improve his life, to better his life, to better his deen, to better his understanding with Ahlul Bayt. These are the days of resolution. These are the days of the revival of the soul. What I would say, say to myself, to all our viewers and lovers of Abu Abdullah alayhi salam, Number one, when it comes to the majalis, from now, we have a few days before, uh, today is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday or Tuesday, Muharram begins. In these three or four days that are there, person takes time, number one, to start reading something about the seerah of Imam Al-Hussein. Number two, some person starts reciting Ziyarat Ashura. From now, prepare yourself for the days of Muharram. For the mothers and the children who are inside the house, part of the house should be covered in black. To remind the children, to teach the children that these are the days of Ashura. There's a pact that is made, for example. There's an understanding. I know of certain households from the day of Muharram until Farhatul Zahra, they don't watch television. Yeah. <laughs> television, yani, they don't, inshallah, with the exception of Imam Hussein TV3. <laughs> Insha'Allah. But movies, cartoons, yeah. all these very, very dramas, the this and that. indo pak community, very common. To remove, even take it out and move it to another room. I even know that, even, 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 watching premiership football. Mm -hmm. People who are yani, they love football. But ihtaram and lil Imam al Hussein, they say, even for that 90 minutes, I don't want to be in a mode or in a mind frame where I've forgotten Imam al Hussein. That's it. Ya yani, in my own way, I'm going to try and sacrifice one pleasure, mm -hmm. one pastime, one relaxation, ihtiraman, out of respect for these days that are there. Something that distinguishes within our own family. I know people 70 days now, huh? They will go to work wearing black. Mashallah. Even at work they are wearing black. Why? Your colleague is bound to ask you. One day, two day, three day, four day, you're wearing black. Baba, they're bound to ask you. You don't have any other clothes or what's the reason of you wearing black? Ahsan, this is a purpose and an opportunity for tabligh inside your workplace. As an accountant, as a lawyer, as a doctor. Now we know of others who are doctors over here uh, within Northwick Park Hospital or uh, uh, the Great Ormond Hospital. I'm not sure, I can't remember one of these. Then uh, they got permission to wear black scrubs. Oh wow! Decided to wear Mashallah. as a doctor black scrubs. Why? Why All the point of tabligh Indeed. that is there. Hence, it becomes important for us that this thikafa, this culture of ensuring that the divinity and the sacredness associated to the days of Muharram are maintained to the highest level, the highest level, person. From these days now, you contemplate from now what you want to achieve. Ani, I decide from tonight, I sit down and I say, you know what? When I go to the mosque, 
I'm not going to have any banter. For the first 12 days, whether it is before the masjid or after the matam, I'm not going to have banter. I'm going to control my tongue because these are the days of grief. It has to be done. And this is an important step. Hadith says when the nights of Shahr Muharram began, when the moon of Shahr Muharram was seen, Imam Al-Qadim was never seen to be smiling. I'm not going to joke, I'm not going to crack banter. Whether it's mustahab, yeah, mustahab, I'm not saying to have banter, but mustahab to be uh, friendly jolly. and to smile and to be jolly, ahsantum, in a non-vulgar way, a non-offensive way. Bas ihtaram and lead these days. Ani, I change my behavior altogether. Mm. See, it's about being in a zone where you're not only grieving when you come to the Husseini or to the Imam Barga. You're in a state of grief and contemplation over Imam al Hussein from the time you wake up to the time you sleep, including the time that you go to work. Now that you're to work, you're all happy, all jolly, and life is normal and everything is going on as normal. We'll just come to the Husseiniyah for that one hour, listen to the Majlis, little bit of Latam, Tabarrukan, and Yalla, go home and life continues as is. Baba, these are the days where life stops. And this is why I say my humble advice, even to our parents, mothers, fathers, academia is very important. And it's important for our children to succeed. But in these days, teach your children that it is okay to be tired a little bit because you stayed up an extra hour doing latam over Imam al Hussein. Teach your child this thikafa, this tarbiyah of enduring a little bit of inconvenience for the sake of Imam al Hussein. I mean, uh, the common one is when. You're sitting in the majlis, mashallah, they get really, really busy, very crowded. You always end up squashed and, you know, always trying to change your legs because your muscles are getting stressed Khair out. Khair and barakat for every cramp that a person gets inside the majlis aza because he's squashed like a, uh, like a sardine inside them cans. Alhamdulillah wa shukar. Alhamdulillah for every cramp in the muscle, Imam al Hussein is delivering him a reward. Bela shakin wala raib. Bela shakin wala raib. You go to work and you're struggling, you can't open your eyes and you have to depend on seven cups of caffeine because you are up till three in the morning changing the clutch in the Husseiniyah. Alhamdulillah wa shukar. Imam al Hussein is rewarding you for that tiredness. Do we have time or are we going on break? No, yeah, we've got time, Sheikh. We, we have got, got time. Of time. Don't worry Alhamdulillah wa shukar. This just uh, the kalam took us towards Imam al Hussein, even though the show is the live faith book and yes. uh, the topic is supposed to be the topic of Tawheed, but in any case, Alhamdulillah, Imam al Hussein, the revolution of Imam al Hussein revolved around Tawheed in its entirety. And this is Ijlalan wa Ikraman lil Imam al Hussein. That we, Shwaya, come out of our bahath, encourage ourselves and encourage the Mushahideen in regards mm -hmm. to Shahr al Muharram, and we come back to our bahath. Um, could you, would you say, Sh Shahr al Muharram? It may be a good time also to look into other Islamic studies, maybe do a little bit of uh, research on Kalam and, and theology to spark that revolution, to strengthen your deen and your understanding of Kalam. Ah, Santo, see, the role of Imam al Hussein, or one of the goals behind this tragedy, as we read in Ziyarat al Arba'in, we have that. Imam al Hussein, I bear witness that you gave your life in order to rescue the people from the tribulations of ignorance. Yani one of the goals of the revolution of Imam al Hussein was to remove people from this sinking ship of ignorance towards knowledge. And seeking knowledge is matloob. What we say is, Within Shahrum Muharram, there is a number of things that need to be benefited from. Yes, a person seeks inspiration through knowledge, even if it is not history with Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein, for example, I read in the Maktal or I hear in the Maktal that at the time of Salatul Dhuhr, Imam al Hussein stopped the battle in order to read Salat. And then in the Ziyar of Imam al Hussein, I say, Ashadu annaka kad akamta Salat. So, I take up readings and research. What is the philosophy of Salat? Number one, what are the ahkam fiqhiyah in regards to perfecting your Salat? 
Number two, I try to motivate myself to at least recite the Salat. If I don't recite Salat, for example, do istighfar, a constant effort to improve. And when we say philosophy of Salat, yani we don't mean the falsafa, yani kufriya, that falsafa of kufr. La, falsafa, yani in terms of uh, uh, the hidden meanings. What does Salat represent? What, what are you saying to Allah when you actually bow down in ruku'? And is it just a position that was ordained by Allah without uh, any uh, reason? What does it mean when you go into sajda? What does that sajda represent? Salat. We mentioned this, I think, in, uh, in the live show for Ghadir. Ihdina siratul mustaqim. When I say, Ya Allah, keep me on the path of siratul mustaqim, yani the path of Amir al-Mu'mineen in my life. Every action from the way I stand to the way I sit to the way I talk to the way I think to the conclusions that I formulate about anything and everything in life. Is it taken from the teachings of Amir al-Mu'mineen? Or is it taken from the enemies of Amir al-Mu'mineen? What does Salat represent? What is the significance of Ruku? What is the significance of Sujood? Yes, then this is Matlub. A person sits and he reads about this. And then he's able to understand at least something of what Imam al Hussein's revolution was. So this is something that is mamduh. This is something that is praiseworthy. Rather, it is something that is matloob. Any form of religious practice or seeking ilm, <coughs> excuse me, from the religious texts, texts of Ahlul Bayt to be in particular, that lead you towards self-improvement. In terms of your akhlaq, in terms of your aqidah, in terms of your faith, this is something that is commendable and it is needed. And at the same time, participation in aza, in the ceremonies of matam, in the ceremonies of the zanjils, in the ceremony of even uh, tatbir and, and uh, zanjirzani, each one has got its role. If a person uh, partakes in whatever he can in order to ensure that his connection with Imam al Hussein is all-encompassing, you take from the ilm and you take from the emotion because this emotion, as we said before, has a dawr and we've spoken about this yani, many times in Majalis of Muharram. Therefore, yes, anything and everything that Within the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, from the text of Ahlul Bayt in terms of ilm and akhlaq that takes them towards self-improvement, then this is the time to make that uh, resolution and that effort. Ahsan, Ahsan, Shaykhah. Shaykh, I think it's really important that, you know, that the people understand the revolution of Abu Abdullah, but also that Shaykh revolution Allah sparks Allah. a revolution in yourself and also sparks a revolution for you to become a better individual, a better human being, a better Muslim, a better follower of Abba Abdullah al-Hussein. And what better way and what better time than Muharram to actually start that revolution and to contemplate on yourself. Inshallah, okay. Shaykh, now we're going to go to a break um, and we can um, start the Kalam lesson after the break. Inshallah, we'll be, Inshallah. Inshallah be taking some questions as well from the viewers. Inshallah, we'll see the viewers after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome to the live faith book, a show that discusses theological arguments from the book Haqq al-Yaqeen. Shaykhna, last week we were discussing having uh, more than one God. It was a topic on Tawheed. We discussed that if there were to be more than one God, um, there would have to be something to distinguish these different beings and the fact that they rely upon that distinguishing factor makes them limited 
and also nullifies them to be considered a god. Um, we also looked at if one god, one being was superior to the other being, this would also nullify one of the, these beings claiming to be god. Let's move on our discussion and move on our lesson to the attributes of God and that these attributes are what unique and specific to God or are they something that can you know be be attained by by anyone sure bismillahir rahmanir rahim the chapter being the first chapter or the first sub chapter under the third section the book or the text that we've been following hakul yakin of marhum sayyid abdullah shabbar rahmatullah alayhi so he comes after establishing the oneness of God, he comes into the chapter of understanding the attributes or the characters of that one God. Ya'ani, from the characters or the attributes, sifat, these sifat or these attributes or characteristics can be divided into two. You have the sifat thubutiyya and you have the sifat salbiyya. Meaning there are those attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal, the positive attributes if you can say. Okay. And you have the negative attributes. Oh, if you can use uh, the word positive and negative. Affirmative and negative, yeah. Affirmative and negative, ahsantum. So he says in each of these attributes, it's important for us to understand these attributes because through these attributes, we are able to understand the grandeur and the splendor of this creator. Over here, Barhum Sayyid Abdullah Shabbar goes on to say, or he begins the topic in this way. In the sifat al kamal wal jamal latun latun hasar li an al khalwi min al kamal naqs. He says that the positive attributes or the affirmative attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal, by the way, which are an expression of the perfection of this one ultimate creator this creator has to be perfect in every sense and cannot have any type of shortcoming cannot have any type of deficiency cannot have any type of limitation the idea over here is limitation in that for a and for an entity or for the lord to be the, the embodiment of perfection. That perfection cannot have any sort of limitation. So we are looking over here in terms of perfection in contrast to any sort of limitation as opposed to a general understanding, linguistic understanding of yes, this thing is perfect, but it is limited or is constrained and sometimes when something is constrained that constraint for example is an indication of its perfection with Allah Azza wa Jal when we are talking about the attributes of Allah this creator of the universe this God is perfect in every aspect of the sense even from the dimension that his perfection cannot be captured because the fact that you can capture this perfection shows that it's it has a limitation Mashallah. Mashallah. so the lack of limitation when you look at the sifat thubutiyya over here the affirmative attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani you are understanding these attributes from the aspect that they cannot be contained or limited Mashallah. again again say it one more time because this is a very very important point for our viewers to understand um, and not I mean I don't want it to like just go over their head uh, so the fact that perfection capturing perfection shows that this perfection isn't perfect uh, is the fact that you can capture that perfection is an indication to the limitation of that perfection and the minute you limit that perfection it's not perfect anymore uh, so that limitation when you say you can capture perfection, it's limited. Allah Azza wa Jal is above and greater any sort of limitation. So that perfection of Allah Azza wa Jal, or in understanding the sifat and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is outside any other type of perfection. Correct me if I'm wrong. So if 
one is able to capture perfection, yes, then that one surely is greater than what he has captured. Could be, of course, because he's in a position to capture. Yes. And if he's in a position to capture, his capability is greater than that perfection because he's able to capture it. Just like, for example, a vessel. You have a five liter vessel. Within that five liter vessel, there is one liter of water. This vessel has captured that mass or that body of water because its ability is greater than the ability of the thing which is captured. Yes. So the same thing, when you come and you say, my mind is able to understand the perfection of Allah in its entirety. Meaning that that perfection of Allah is limited such that your mind was able to encompass. What we say is Allah's perfection is far greater than that. I don't even say Allah's perfection. Sometimes I'm scared, yani, these ta'birat in order just to make the, the, the meaning clearer yeah, yes. leads towards taqseer or some sort of uh, kufur even. In indeed, other words, indeed. you're talking about Allah Azza wa Jalla and His uh, attributes. So yani, the sifat of Allah, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are greater than to be. The attributes through which He's understood are greater than to be captured. So, Coming back, the lack of the inability of us to limit that perfection or the fact that perfection cannot be captured and is free of any limitation is what we are pointing towards. Just a quick reminder to our viewers that um, we are taking questions in on the WhatsApp. So if you do have a question in regards to today's lesson, the number should be at the bottom there on the lower third. And inshallah, we'll be able to discuss and answer your question, inshallah. Shaykh, now please continue. So he says over here, for example, this is the meaning that say the Shubbar comes out with. So he says over here, Wal maqsud min sifat إذ صفاته تعالى لكي لا كيف يلها ولا سبيل إلى إدراكها. In regards to the sifat thubutiya, the affirmative attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal, in terms of the reality of that perfection, cannot be comprehended by the mind in its entirety for what they truly represent. So we understand them, for example, from what it contradicts. So for example, he says over here that uh, when you say that Allah, for example, is alim, وَهُوَ لَا كُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ For example, this ilm of Allah, you cannot capture the ilm. The ilm of Allah Azza wa Jal cannot be captured, has no restriction. But you are understanding the perfection of Allah, of the ilm through the sifat of ilm, in contradiction to the fact that the Lord of the universe cannot be a jahil. We understand? Ya'ani? We're, we are not in a position to understand the extent of this ilm, but through by knowing that he is alim or alim against jahal. That the universe, the Lord of the universe, cannot be, cannot have the characteristics of being ignorant. If we were to jump into the bahath over here, there is word on the first sifat of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this first sifat is Al-Qudra. Wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir, for example. What does Qudra mean? Qudra, yani again, rough translation, basic translation, yani capable over everything. He has power over everything. So, the first characteristic of your Lord in terms of the Sifat Thubutiya is that the Lord of the universe has power and has capability to do anything and has power over everything. So. There cannot be a time where he's not able so. to do anything. 
And he comes and he says over here, this Qudra, the fact that Allah is all powerful, is able to do anything, is not restricted through inability. Okay. Allah Azza wa Jal cannot be restricted through inability. I see. And hence Qudra his, has power and domain over everything. What is the proof for this? You look at the creation of Allah and you find that in almost every series, in almost every seating, we come back when it comes to methodology of proof, we come back to pondering over the existence of Allah. As, uh, we come back to establishing the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal by looking at the creation. Sahil Ola. Therefore, you find again, Say the Shubbar pulls us towards that direction. And from here we are able to understand the importance of tafakkur when the Rasulullah said one hour of tafakkur is better than for example 70 years of ibadah. So in order to understand and to establish that Allah Azza wa Jalla from his sifat is qudra, the all powerful over everything, has domain and power over everything within the creation. So the proof for that is what? Look at the system of creation. The perfection within the system of creation shows you the power of the creator over this entire system of creation. The perfection is an indication of his qudra, of his power. And that's now why when you come and you see over the last seven or eight lectures or shows that we have had the importance of contemplating over the creation. Now you start to realize how huh, within the Quran why is it that Allah Azza wa Jal in numerous places tells us contemplate over the sun and the, yes, uh, and the moon and contemplate over the sky and contemplate over the day and the night. Why? multiple times in multiple places in the Quran you find that this is the key to unlock the mysteries of the ghaib in regards to understanding our Lord and understanding ourselves so say the Shammar comes here and he says in regards to the first thing over here in like what is the proof that Allah is Qadir that he is all powerful, has powerful over everything within the creation. Look at the perfection within the creation itself. Do we have time to continue with the discussion? Inshallah, we, we, we do. We have plenty of time, Sheikh. No. How much Please time continue. in? Uh, how much time in? Five minutes. We have five minutes. <laughs> yeah, Allah. Okay. So if we have five minutes, we'll maybe use this five minutes for a quick discussion, not within the book, but related to our topic. So we establish, and the verse of the Quran. Again, because our aim is to establish our Aqidah through the Quran and the Hadith of Ahlul Bayt. A person comes, everyone should know from the Quran, as Shia Ahlul Bayt, when you believe your God is all-powerful, this Quran which is revealed by Allah, which verses speak about this? There are a number of verses. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Surah Al-Baqarah, Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. He has power and domain over everything. Another verse from Surah Al-Yaseen, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Innama amruhu ida arada shay'an an yakula lahu kun fayakun. When Allah wants a certain edict or command to be executed, when He wants anything to be done, all He says is kun, be, and it becomes. Ahsant. Shaykh, I've got a question here. It's, it's coming from um, an Ali from Birmingham, and he says, uh, you're talking about the Qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his ability and his powers. How do we refute those who say, can God make a rock so heavy even he can't lift it? Can God make a rock so heavy such that even he cannot lift it himself? Even Allah cannot lift it himself. Good question. Over here, however, the question has a uh, flaw in it with all due respect to the brother. Because you see, with questions like these, if I say, if a person was to say, oh, Allah can do everything. 
<laughs> of course he can create the rock so heavy. Okay, so you answered one, but you put yourself in a mess because now you, Allah has apparently created something that he is unable to even carry himself. Exactly. So if you ithmat, if you establish this, you kill yourself in this. Or on the other hand, I come and I say, no, Allah can't do this. Which means that ah, Allah is not Qadir anymore. Sahih. Sahih. What we come and we say is, my dear brother, it's a good question. However, your question in itself is flawed from a logical perspective. Mantik, the question in itself is flawed. We have a right way of asking a question and we have a wrong way of asking questions. We have questions that are logically structured to be correct and there are certain questions where the question in itself is questionable. Yes. How so? The question in itself is flawed. When you say, can God create a stone so heavy that he himself cannot carry it? Means that, in essence, you are asking, can the creator have the ability or the power to create something more powerful than itself? Or does the creator have the ability to create something and the production or the creation of that entity is greater in capability than the one who created it? So we ask ourselves over here, the question, logically speaking, that can you have a creator who creates from nothing something that is greater in capability than that original creator? <laughs> the question has a flow. <laughs> Definite. The question has a flow in that if the creator created something that is more powerful than him, then that something powerful deserves to be the creator. But that something powerful cannot be a creator because it was brought into existence by another creator. Awesome. So logically, the question is flawed. flawed. I, see, I, said. I mean, an another one that I remember from my RE uh, lessons at high school, um, can God make two plus two, five, equal five? I mean, this is, this is, is it's not fair to say it, it can't do it, but it's, this is wrong. How can two, you know, units plus another two units equal five? It doesn't make sense. It's, it's error. Not only does it make sense. Some, what is the wisdom behind that? What would be the wisdom behind Allah Azza wa Jal being able to change that law? Is there a wisdom? Because in addition to him being Qadir, he is also Hakim. Hassan, thank you very much, Sheikh. Now, this is all what uh, time we've got today, and unfortunately, Masha'Allah, it was a great lesson. Inshallah, we'll be joining our viewers on the next episode of the Facebook, Inshallah. Until then, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah Wa Barakatuh.